So a uh, big welcome to Tim. Thank you too. <laughs> so it, yeah, it's, uh, applause is very nice when you work in one-to-one -one performance and people just leave. Uh, <laughs> yes, um, I can continue and explain a little bit. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I'm, uh, yeah, a sound artist, a performance artist, installation artist, I guess, and uh, also a sound designer for for uh, spatial audio works. So I'm working with um, VR projects, doing sound design for VR projects and sound recording and mixing for that. Um, I'm doing some theatre projects where they're interested in immersive sound particularly. Uh, some theatre projects where kind of more regular sound design, except I'm trying to sneak in, <laughs> in like different approaches. Um, and some film projects as well. So I'm, I guess uh, similar to, it's like a being an artist is a bit like an octopus. You, 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 yeah, you try different things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So I'm sort of um, split between a few different things, but generally, this talk about one-to-one -one practice is sort of the thing that hangs them all together, and um, and how I work with sound is also a big um, a big kind of thread amongst all the different activities. So, but this is great because normally I'm talking about specific. Uh, projects or I'm talking about spatial audio and this is actually the first time I think I've spoken about generally what I do. Uh, so it was actually quite hard because I've realised I've done a lot of different things but I think it's quite interesting to look at this idea of one-to-one -one and, and how that informs how I work with sound, with collaborations, with audiences, um, not just in performance but in various different ways. So um, is this okay or do you need the lights off? See? Yeah. So, so it's good. good. Yeah? Okay. So, uh, and as I was mentioning before, I mean, um, presentations is not such a, a strong point of mine because I'm quite used to um, improvising things or, or like uh, not working with so much visual material actually. So um, I get a bit excited about doing this. <laughs> and then when I'm also a bit like, what's the next thing? <laughs> so, uh, so I've tried to keep it a bit, uh, a bit s s like where where it's needed. Uh, so this, uh, hello Cleveland. Uh, you know this, the Spinal Tap reference. Does anyone know this reference? Not really. No. Okay. There's a. This is. Good. Oh, this is the second time I've done a Spinal Tap reference, and it has, it's, it's just. Last time, actually, the lecturers and I laughed, and the students didn't know. But, um, so there's a film called Spinal Tap, or This Is Spinal Tap, from the 80s. It was kind of one of the first, um, you could say, mockumentaries. So it's about a, about a rock band, a fi fictitious rock band, but they'd taken elements of things that had happened in that kind of area of uh, extravagant 70s like prog rock bands, like hard rock bands, all of those, like, stupid stories you'd hear about the excess of it and, and what their demands were and how they were behaving and what they expected and things like that. And so there's a whole like uh, film made as if it's a documentary about this band of that era and uh, it's, it's very funny if you haven't seen it, it's, it's quite funny. And of course musicians identify with it a lot because they're like, oh yeah, we had this moment. But in, uh, I don't have a screenshot, but, but there's this one point where they, they go on stage, I think it's maybe the same time they get lost backstage and they can't find the stage and they emerge out and it's like, hello Cleveland, and it's like, we're not Cleveland, you know, because <laughs> they're so, so used to like being this audience. Uh, but this is, uh, so that's the joke, yeah. yeah. Those guys were like Saturday Night Live guys, right? Yeah, that's I think guys. a lot of them, yeah, yeah. yeah and a lot of them were, were from the States, but they're playing this British rock band, so they have really funny names like yeah. Nigel Tufnell, like this really like <laughs> British name, <laughs> and they're doing this kind of funny act. It's, it's a, yeah, it's a funny film. It's where uh, Taking It Up to Eleven comes from. Uh, but yeah, but this bit I think is a nice uh, lead in to, to what I'm going to talk about. So, uh, this, like, Hello Cleveland, bands being on the road. Oh, that's the lighter thing. Yeah, yeah. The rock band. Yeah. I thought you meant they were talking about lights. <laughs> no, does that have a light? Yeah. You said it was an imaginary this is, band. Yeah, this is, this is linked to what I'm about to say, actually. So, um, <laughs> this, like, communication. This is an imaginary lighter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Getting into it. So, so uh, the idea of this is uh, you have these bands going on stage, and they don't know what, of course, they don't know. It's like everyone looks the same. They don't, they don't you know, they're getting the wrong... Uh, city and it's very funny because you know they're not in that city. It actually happened to um, 
Oh, was it? Guns N' Roses, actually. Uh, for real, after the film. They actually had this moment. And they were like, hello, Sydney. And it was Melbourne. Yeah. <laughs> so, it's just, so, it, it, it's, so a lot of the stuff has actually come true before or after the film. Um, so there's this idea, you know, you, you, you're performing stuff, you're going in front of an audience, and uh, what is the audience? Like, what do you see? Do you see a mass? Do you see, you know, someone you recognise, someone looks familiar? Are you just seeing faces and it's just, you know, it could be any city? Or is it specifically this group? So that's one way, and I think that's more of a... Um, as funny as it is, it's, it's, it's more of like a way that you might work with, particularly with theatre, uh, with big group audiences. You have this, uh, in traditional theatre, you have the proscenium arch, you have the stage, you have the audience there. You have raked seating, you can't necessarily see the seating. Also, if you're a musician, you don't necessarily... The first time I was, when I was playing guitar years ago, and I did like a, you know, a gig thing, just a, like a gig night, open mic night. And I was just like, oh, these lights are bright. I can't see anything. You know, it's like I can't see anything out there. Um, so that's one approach. Um, this is another approach. There was um, when I was younger, I was watching the the Foo Fighters play um, Glastonbury on just on TV actually. Uh, and I think remember Dave Grohl like seeing someone. I think it was with the yellow shirt uh, or red shirt maybe. But uh, he, he he saw someone and he was like he could see them because they were so tall. And he pointed them out and said, "This is the, this is the song is for you." So he was identifying with someone in the crowd. I mean, lots of bands also do this. Of course, he's, he's seeing someone directly and he's, he's acknowledging that they're there. So this is kind of what I'm uh, starting to, to explore in my work, where how you go from something that you present and you're just having people come and it's like different people to starting to see these people uh, with the yellow shirt. The red shirt, yeah, Mike <laughs> Camilla. So I think uh, so. That's a little bit of where this is kind of come from. These these works that I'm making. That's sort of where they're coming from. Looking at different ways of interacting with an audience rather than seeing a sea of faces, but actually trying to find resonances uh, with it. Uh, yeah. So we're gonna do a little thing. <laughs> so if you want to turn your chairs and face away from the table. And if you close your eyes, okay. it's take a, it would take a while to listen to the room, then I'm going to walk around. When I'm in front of you, you can open your eyes. But when I'm in front of you, Okay, so uh, you're welcome to turn back around uh, or not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, so what I'm working with really is, um, I think it's on the next slide, is moving away from this type of approach to to art. Um, where <laughs> this is like you know of course the ex quite a funny extreme example, um, 
where this you can say you have specific individual responses to the Mona Lisa mm -hmm. but it's so uh, of course it's so like mediated I mean you can see with the phones um, that even if you wanted to have your own response to the Mona Lisa and you were trying to forget everything you knew about it in this moment you have so many people around you um, uh, there's actually I didn't actually do another photo where you see the cordon of like the queue of people but that whole framing it's really working against this kind of re relationship you could have with an artwork this is another example I don't know if you know Marina Bramovich yeah so this uh, is also quite interesting, um, and this is my take on on one to one. But mm. for me, it's not so much about this either, because here, um, it's very it's an interesting work in itself. But you kind of wonder how much of the, <laughs> I mean, I can just see the crowd in the background. That's what I see. Uh, how much intimacy could you create with this? How much uh, connection with the artist? with this framing uh, and I mean it doesn't necessarily mean it's the point to do that but again for me it's you, these things this um, frameworks these uh, societal patterns uh, all matter to, to when you want to create something that's a different type of connection was it important uh, in the last picture yeah. if you go back yeah to know what those people are looking at you, you see how mm -hmm. they're all looking that way. Yeah, they're, they're, I mean, I think it's the presence. It's, I think for me, it's um, it's about the presence of people ah. around you and the context of like queuing, waiting up for something. Yeah, that that's the frame. So whether you feel looked at at the time or whether you don't, yeah. it's about the presence of that it's ah. the, and the framing. Yeah, that's for me. I mean, uh, you could say this is one to one, uh, of course, but for me, with my practice. It's that's I'm trying to get away from that and trying to to do um, this approach where it's I'm trying to look at um, these intimate moments with, with with somebody and that doesn't have to be between me and the person it could be between an artwork it could be between a sound design it could be between an audio visual work but something that's uh, a connection individual connection the challenge is. Um, what you think might happen, mm. things getting away from this frame, often denying language, it's something that you can't necessarily explain, which is quite difficult now <laughs> this presentation, and it goes against these kind of formats. So, so, so the one-to-one -one practice that I'm doing, this doesn't necessarily go for everything, but um, it's really focusing on uh, how to build these connections. Um, a w as a difference from something where you're part of a group um, or you're framed by a group uh, or framed, framed by a structure that expects you to do certain things. So for me, I'm making works that kind of go more into this intimacy um, with the possibilities of what can happen. And just to give some examples, um, I made a work um, in Konsthallen in Lund and um, during that, at the end of the performance, um, the audience member got like a, a, a flashlight that I've been using. It was the only light source in the room. It was completely dark otherwise. And uh, they got it at the end, and they were able to look around the room and see what was there. And uh, I hadn't realized, actually, but I think I'd seen it on the side at some point, but hadn't really noticed. There was a cowboy hat <laughs> left in this on the shelf. It was, uh, there were like some work rooms. And uh, I didn't really think about it so much until uh, one of the participants saw this cowboy hat and saw me standing there waiting uh, while they looked around and started dressing me as a cowboy yeah. <laughs> and I stood there. Uh, and another time, um, uh, someone started to really not behave how you would expect. It, 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 um, if you're, for example, saying something in a performance context, and she starts trying to ask me questions and have a conversation and tell me about how much she likes the dark. Um, and uh, it's like, how do you... How do you handle that? It's like a kind of really interesting thing that happens when you, someone doesn't behave as you expect, um, and you can of course say this is not, you know, this is not what, what I, I, I want. You know, like you, you should be listening to me or you should be doing this, but it's like what is the should be thing is is with me. It's like 
I should be open to this person and how they want to respond. And um, and if I fear that it's counterproductive or well, it could be extreme dangerous. I know Marina Ramich has been situations like that. Then it's up. To, it's it's kind of what do I what do I want to allow and um, what freedom am I giving? How are they responding in this moment? But really, it's about these kind of a different way of working with audiences. Um, and in a way, it's like almost the audience word becomes a problem. So you might want to say participant as well, but that also doesn't quite fit. So sometimes it's just thinking of another. It's basically uh, how I like to, to frame these interactions. Yeah. <laughs> so talking of which, this structure is also difficult to talk about one-to-one -one. <laughs> because we're expecting uh, you to, to, to sit here listening and watching the screen and watching me but uh, this is one framework but I'm gonna just talk now <laughs> I think in a different way so uh, it's not the end there's some pictures later the end of my intro to one-to-one to -one. so I'm gonna come actually nobody with the cameras here maybe I should say it but um, yeah so it's just to think about um, these kind of structures and assumptions that we have. Like you have a uh, you have a concert, you have a performance. You, you expect people to sort of come a certain way. So what I'm uh, exploring is more how you can have people coming into something and what do they know beforehand, what don't they know, uh, what type of audience are they, um, and how do you kind of work with that rather than trying to target your your audience. Um, for me, it helps because my partner um, works uh, in, in uh, science, in uh, biomedical sciences. So, um, and a lot of uh, her friends also hang out with us. So, it's always a kind of nice um, reminder that actually there's very different ways of seeing things. So, if I'm explaining some of my work to her, her and her friends, then it's it seems you know it can seem quite weird. Uh, if I explain something to people here, it seems quite normal. <laughs> so, that's always interesting to be aware of that. It's like. How, how would other people from different backgrounds find uh, find this kind of work? So uh, I thought it could be interesting to talk a bit about how I ended up with this. Because <laughs> it's kind of, uh, I've been asked a few times about why I'm working with one-to-one -one and, and like how do you do it and uh, where does it, where, like what, what interests you about it? So um, just to give a brief thing and also I'll show some examples so it's not so abstract. but. Um, I think uh, with, with my practice, I, I wasn't, um, I wouldn't say I was a, a, an artist uh, until I uh, graduated uh, from my drama degree in 2011. Um, I w wouldn't say I was into drama before I started my drama degree in 2007. Um, I wouldn't really say I was anyone I thought of as being creative before the age of 16. So. Um, and I think that's kind of interesting now, thinking about why I'm working with this. So um, I was kind of kid with a not of I wouldn't say a very uh, like on paper artistic family, um, and a family that kind of expected you to get a proper job. Um, and I and I think you know most of the people I knew were not really doing anything. Just I knew a few people later on that were maybe um, amateur theatre and stuff and and singing and stuff. But uh, but when I was younger, I didn't really know anyone doing that, so I didn't really think it was it was uh, yeah I didn't think you could do that. Um, so when I kind of started my education, I, I did like more um, uh, subjects that were kind of more straight subjects, I guess, and then I just found out I couldn't couldn't do it. <laughs> like I could maybe technically do some of it, but I just it wasn't really clicking. Uh, so I kind of started to learn the guitar because I saw a lot of bands. It was quite in the end of the 90s in the UK, so a lot of like guitar bands all over the place. So I was like, this is really, this is amazing. This is like, wow, that's such a different way of living, you know. And um, so I thought this is kind of cre creativity. And it's like, what is this? So I kind of went really into to that and started to learn the guitar and wanted to be a musician and, uh, for, for quite a while. And then, uh, and I hadn't really stopped and thought, well, like, what, what do I want to do? It's more like this is cool. This is like this is the only thing I'm seeing, and I thought that's what that's what I want. And um, and that kind of went until I started doing uh, a degree. And the, the, my drama degree came out because um, uh, this is not stuff you should be admitting in a talk, but I think it's interesting. So, so uh, I did, did a drama degree because you have to 
kind of go and get a degree really to, to get any kind of job and um, and I basically ended up in a situation where I was doing like office work um, trying to make money to buy the next guitar or something um, and it was starting to get quite depressing and it's like I could stay in this office job if I don't make it as a musician it's, it's gonna be my life um, and then uh, my girlfriend was saying okay let's let's look at some some degrees and um, I just chose some universities based on cities that I thought were pretty cool in the UK. And then I got a pile of the prospectuses and then um, she was a bit surprised when I said I wanted to do drama because I hadn't done it before. And I basically went through the prospectus and I, 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 I tried to empty any preconceptions of what I should do. And I, and I basically went for every subject and took out the, 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 the name of the subject. So I just read the description without that word in it. So I remember coming to the drama one and so I ignored the word drama. I just read it, and it was about um, exploring creativity, sort of researching um, different methods, um, kind of, of course, expressing yourself and trying different things. I was like, "Wow, this is really exciting! This is kind of really, uh, yeah." Something. And then I was like, "But, but it's drama. You know, I, I don't have. I've never really been to the theatre, and I mean, I've watched films a bit, but you know." I wouldn't say I'm a drama candidate at all, but um, but over the next few days I thought more about it, and then um, it's like this actually really yeah this is kind of really exciting. So I kept going with it, and then I applied, um, and then I somehow got an interview day at a few other universities, and then I got in. I was a bit older, like uh, 25 when I started, so I was a bit older than I mature students are a bit of a rarer thing in the UK, sadly. So I was a mature student at the age of 25, and. Um, and we had like a drama workshop on the interview day and it was the first one I'd ever done. So in my interview they're like, how did you find it? I was like, well, so I think it was the first one, it was really, really nice. And uh, I was like, what do you know? And, and there was this moment in the workshop where we were told to walk around the space. I'd, I'd never heard that before. It was like, this is a strange thing to say, but okay. Um, and then the person giving the workshop was like, now imagine you're being watched. And everyone around me, not kidding, they, they kind of went into like jazz hands. They just kind of went like this. Like walking around, and I was like, I didn't know what's that. And I was like, okay. Then I imagine someone's watching me. So, so that was kind of how I started my drama degree. And then it was the other students that were starting to teach me little bits about uh, how to perform on stage and things like that. Uh, but the thing was about that course was that it was quite um, really breaking down how a lot of the other the, the the way of thinking about drama had been taught early on before university. So actually, we were all in the same boat, but. But my, uh, my, my kind of realisation with that was uh, just to kind of go into it, just to be open, try different things, and just um, just see what happens. And it was like, yeah, I was doing such a shitty job before that. It was, the audition day was like, I just get a day off this work, you know, and then see. So, t so taking it by a bit at a time, kind of going kind of all in, and like, this is, you know, I'm so lucky to be trying something creative. Um, and just sort of being open to everything. And that's kind of, what started me into actually I'm really enjoying this and um, and I'm getting something from this that I wasn't really finding with music in a, in, a, in the sense that I knew of it um, so I started to work more with with making performances and I really enjoyed that more than looking at film analysis for example and um, I was still very interested in sound and I was also interested in technology of sound so I was doing some more sound design so then when I graduated I was really hooked and I was like I'm going to be a performance artist after it which was again like it's like the it's not really the thing you really want to be announcing when you when you finish because it's not the most uh, secure thing afterwards so then I was working with that and and one to one was something that I came across during the last bits of my degree so there was um, a sort of trend in the UK at the time for one to one works to be coming out and um, it was quite a new concept to some of us we you know like we thought theatre, you have a, a group of people sitting there, um, maybe participatory performance, you have a group of people going around to get together around a building or something, experiencing different things. But uh, the one to one thing was quite different um, and quite exciting because it felt more like really guerrilla type performance. So they had a festival in London um, at the Battersea Arts Centre, which was uh, lots of different artists, lots of them I didn't know, some of the names I recognised. And it was in an old town hall, and you would basically book a certain. It was like a quite a menu. You chose like a, you know the the daring menu or the whatever menu, and you'd have certain performances you'd go and see in that evening. And it was the first time I'd ever been to London, and actually liked it because 
normally in London it's so many people, so much noise. It's really very different pace, and um, if you're not used to that or you don't really enjoy that, it's um, can, you feel very anonymous and very like I need to get space from this. And on this occasion, I travelled down by myself to go and check this out. Um, none of my friends were <laughs> was coming at the time, and then I went to this place that I hadn't been to before, and I tried these performances, and I had this connection with all of these different artists and with other audience members between the performances and it was it was amazing it was like the first time I'd really felt like I'm happy to be here and it's like I'm really there's something really nice it's like rewarding for coming down to this and then I got to see some really interesting works and they were in different rooms different parts of the building uh, really exploring and amongst this there were starting to be some things in Bristol where I was studying as well and one of the most uh, memorable experiences was on paper something that's really boring so on paper it would read you have a 10 minute time slot. Someone comes in through a door, there's some curtains in it, it just sort of like opened in front of them into an empty room, uh, and they're told to wait for the performance to start. After 10 minutes, they're let out. Okay, that's on, that's on paper, right? Uh, super, super like, okay. But what happened in that 10 minutes was that I went in there, was waiting for this thing to start, and I was suddenly aware of so many different things about the room, the smell of the room, the sound of the room, people walking past in the corridor behind me, how the room looked. I was really exploring like all those little bits that I would normally not have paid attention to. I was aware of myself, like I, yeah, I'm feeling kind of a bit like, oh, what's going to happen? I, you know, and then it's like, ah, nothing's going to happen. Oh, okay then, and, and I'm not worried about this. What are they doing? You know, and then it's sort of like, but maybe something will. Happen. Maybe they're watching me. Maybe they're not watching me. Maybe I'm just watching myself. Like, should I just leave, or should I? Is someone going to open the door? <laughs> and this is kind of interesting. Who made this? Like, why have they have they done this before? So, like, there's a whole process. So, in ten minutes, so much happened with me in different like modes and different uh, uh, tones that actually, after that ten minutes, it was, in my opinion, by far the most interesting work than the actual ones where you went in with the performer uh, on that evening. So, so from this, I was like, there's something really special about this format um, and this way you can start working with people. And one of the things I was also realizing was that when you're working with um, one specific audience member, you're not only just um, trying, it means that you don't know who's going to come in. So you have to resist these assumptions, but you're also suddenly aware of these other things. So you're aware of like, what are they thinking about this room? Like, uh, what's the temperature like? Um, if there's a sound, I mean, it's like in theatre, you have certain things like you're kind of used to sound coming from speakers, right? But if you're yeah, having one audience member and they don't know what to expect, even if it's in a theatre, it's going to seem pretty weird if the theatre speakers just suddenly start playing. So why would they start being used? Um, or is there another way to start? You know, is it headphones is better? But then how do they get the headphones? Why have they got headphones? Um, a lot of these things that you would take for granted in a group format suddenly become questions. So, which also means that they're possibilities. So now I was starting to look at immersive technology. Um, I just recently heard some binaural sound and not a one-to-one -one work, but a, a different um, uh, art piece. So I realized that you could do so much with sound and presence and having sound coming from all directions. Um, and I was like, this is actually really super interesting because we have this connection that you're trying to create with someone and this like heightened sensitivity to the to the context and then you have these technologies that can facilitate that or change that perception in, in very quickly or, or very slowly and without them realizing you can start to kind of it's almost like uh, playing these different elements you know bring in the room bring in okay, Mike, how are you now? You know, you, you need a toilet break. <laughs> or like, uh, you know, how, how did you get here? Um, do we need to take it slower? Or like, you want to faster, you know? So all of these things um, suddenly became part of the work. So I was talking to an artist the other day and um, about thinking about audience because I think it's quite a common thing that you tend to make artwork that you, you want to experience yourself, right? But... Um, the artist I was talking to was saying that they don't really think about the audience. It's just like they, they do something and then that's the last thing they think about. And I was like, but that's the first thing I think about. Well, maybe I have an idea. Then it's the first thing I think about. Because for me, it's like if I'm making something, 
and I'm not thinking about them, then it's like, why am I, there's no, you know, then I'm just going to go for, do it for myself, and it's, it's just a, you know, it's just a diversion for something. But if I'm going to do something that I want people to experience, then I should be thinking about them at the start, because this thing I want to curate or share with them or work with them together, then they need to be part of that equation. I can't just... So how do you do that when you're not assuming stuff about them? So that's the, the kind of challenge. How do you um, try to imagine all the different possibilities that could happen? Because there's always things that happen, like the cowboy hat that you didn't think would happen, like someone walking out because they're... I don't think this guy actually heard with his hearing aids, <laughs> so he just left halfway through a performance once. Um, how do you not have that completely kill something but embrace that um, and that's the challenge that's mainly at the core of every project I do. How do you allow these things to be open yet you still maybe want a framework to allow it to happen and to kind of have something where you're not putting the pressure onto the, uh, the other person to, to carry it. You know, how do you carry it and they feel supported they might not be used to performance, they might not be used to, let's say, spatial audio, they might not be used to, to coming to, to a place like this. Um, you know, I mean, sometimes you, people literally come in by accident, they kind of get grabbed by someone, oh, have you checked this out? Uh, so I have had that happen, so people are just, they know nothing about it, they're just kind of coming in cold to experience. So that means I have to work quite hard with, um, it's called in VR, uh, onboarding and offboarding. This idea that you take somebody uh, from the first time they, I mean, in the cases I work with, it's more like the first time they hear about something, first time they, they know about something that might interest them. How do you take it from that point to when they're physically leaving or the, the work is technically finishing? And even how do you take it beyond that? Like what's left later? How do they remember this experience? How do they? Uh, how does that change over time and um, is there something you really want to, to stand out with that? So there's a lot of um, questions but I think there's a lot of possibilities in that approach. So that's kind of why I'm still working with one-to-one -one, because there's a lot of different ways you can start to work with these ideas and a, a lot of different contexts you can apply it. So I'm not just applying it to performances, I'm also thinking about this with sound works, uh, with teaching <laughs> or talks. Um, and also with um, when I'm working on sound design for like a VR project, I'm also that very heavily in, interested in that. Like how do you uh, have people come into this experience? How do you transition between environments in a virtual space, for example? How do you work with their sense of presence uh, or not? And how do you um, allow them to, to feel like they're being supported and they're sort of free to, to explore within this? So that's sort of where I'm kind of heading with, with my thoughts on the projects that we're going to look at. Um, and one other thing to say is um, they're not always working with technology in a very obvious way. So the first thing I made after my degree was in a dark room with, um, yeah, it's the one with the cowboy hat. It's the, the flashlight. It had a, I had the flashlights, a torch. I was working with distance and proximity. And going back to that work, I realized how much it was about listening. So even though I didn't think of it as being about sound so much, now with hindsight I'm like, yeah, I can see why I'm working so much with sound actually, even before I realized I was doing it. So, if you have any questions by the way, or just, or. I did hmm? have a thought about yeah? the name for, instead of audience, mm -hmm. interactor. Yeah. Yeah. Because participant is also some, something else, right? Yeah. Yeah. But I think it's also then it's a question of how do they interact and what does that uh, mean? Um, so I think that's something that's interesting too. I, I, a lot of it is like, it's not the word, it's like how we think of the word, mm -hmm. isn't it? Because mm -hmm. I have this thought that like a lot of things that I would describe as uh, interactive Again, on paper, they're not interactive. It's like, you know, someone walks into a room, stands there, nothing happens for 10 minutes. But in, I would say that was highly interactive because I was so engaged in that uh, mentally uh, and also physically. I mean, I, I felt like 
you know, I felt the whole like, oh, what am I doing? Like, there's, there's no one here. Like, is there someone going to jump out? And you know, like, I'm going to jump in a minute. So I physically felt that response. And then at certain points, I felt very calm. And then I felt like, oh, now I'm kind of confident and like, oh, it doesn't matter, you know, because I'm, I'm, I, I'm, yeah, whatever. <laughs> They're not going to, if they jump out now, it's like, ah, yeah, so what? So I went through a whole different, like, physical emotions too with that. Um, so I'd say that was highly interactive. So I think it's, like you say, it's like interactor. It's very interesting because. For some people, that would mean one thing, but I think probably for us, maybe we'd think of something a bit different. Yeah. Well, it, it really depends on the people, right? So yeah. Interactor could be an interesting phrase, but mm. for some people, it's totally inappropriate because mm. they might just they might just not care. Mm. They'll leave after two minutes. Yeah. And in that case, there's no interactivity if, mm. if they just shut off. So it's it's <coughs> interesting, right? Because yeah. sometimes it's a pro sometimes it works, sometimes. Mm. You know, people are in different spaces. But but I would say if someone leaves, that's a really big interaction. Yeah, I wouldn't think mm. so too. Mm. Well, depending on what you're interacting with. Well, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. But I think it's um, because you're not interacting yeah. with the artwork as it is, but with no. their life and the situation. Yeah. Well, that's, but maybe you're responding to that, so it's it's um, yeah. 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 yeah yeah So it's like a, an active choice. So I, I yeah. think. Um, that's right. I do, I do have a habit of trying to encourage people to, um, if they're not enjoying something, just leave, you know, Get because it's, uh, I think it's one of the really, I've started doing it a bit actually, I feel a bit bad, but um, really? yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm like, uh, it's not, my comfort zone is to be kind of polite and, and respect something, but I think, um, was it my, yeah, my grandma actually, when she was just turned 80, she told me, she was like, I don't feel any, any different really to how I was when I was 17, except I just know my own mind more. And I've been, uh, actually, you know what, it's like, I mean, now I have kids and stuff, so it's like, if I'm going to an art event, it's usually, like, it's it's not so common now, because I have to, like, plan time for it and things. And so now I'm a bit more like that. It's like, if I'm really not enjoying it, or if I feel that someone is um, being self-indulgent and, and not respecting the fact that we're all giving a lot of time to experience this, um, then I will have started to walk off, actually. And it feels great. I encourage everyone to do it because it's like you shouldn't feel that you have to be um, in this mode. And um, I think the the best thing you can do is like, no, I mean, uh, you know, thank you for. I'm glad I experienced this, but uh, you know, this is I'm, I'm done. Or or if something's really interesting, then of course you can express that in a different way. But I think the whole like when I'm working with one to one, this comes across very strongly. You know, some if. If I've failed in some part, it's very clear. If I allow people space to, like for example, one of the projects I'm going to show you, people are given enough, like they're not told when to leave, they're just told they can stay in the room for as long as they want. And I've noticed that most people do stay in there quite a long time and they seem to be quite thankful when they come out that they've had this time and they're kind of told they can leave when they want. And it's also during the work, they're told that if they have problems, they can contact me. And I have had people kind of, not very often, but I have had people have problems when I do things in darkness for, for their strong emotions. So don't you think that's kind of a class thing and also mm. a societal thing, like how well you're educated that you want to be more respectful of the thing that you're attending? Um, yeah, I mean, and, uh, yeah. But if you're from a different sort of class, mm. then it would be like, what fuck that? I don't know. I don't know if it's maybe as clear as that. I think it's... Um, well, I think it, mm. um, particularly from the states, mm. it's 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 maybe more prevalent than mm. the UK. I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I mean, in the UK, if there's some been some, what I would say, quite privileged people who have been more like that, actually, yeah. more. Um, so I think it's, yeah, I mean, it's definitely an attitude and definitely a, a kind of contextual um, issue. What you're used to, how how do you see people behaving? What do you think is okay? Um, but yeah, but I think it's if, if someone walks out, it's um, I, I kind of I kind of <laughs> like that anyway. I mean, I I mean personally, I feel quite bad if it's something because I've done it. So um, it's because I now have this uh, way of working where I I try to respect who are, the audience. So um, I respect that they're giving me time and they're trying something because uh, again, it's like if you're working with one-to-one -one performances and it's not in a uh, I mean even if it's in a very like comfortable environment you're still basically asking someone to by themselves go into something without necessarily knowing what's going to happen and even if they know a lot about it even if they know me 
I've had friends do stuff and they don't they're still a bit worried because they like they don't know what I'm going to do in the performance even if they know me really well so it basically every time I've seen that people are giving a lot of trust um, and I and when I was in my drama degree of course we used to mess around with audiences a lot but but now it's like I see the value in acknowledging that and respecting that it doesn't mean you have to be nice to the audience it doesn't mean you have to be um, really kind of uh, like, like in a, in a way very slow and, and respectful. But you have to be you have to be kind of clear that what you're doing uh, is kind of for both for for both you and bits for them. It's this context you can build together rather than I'm going to do this regardless and then they're just going to have to. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the history that I'm aware of it goes back to at least Kenneth Gaburo and Pauline Oliveros in the states from UCSD, and because mm. there's that whole experimental. Um, thing that people are doing that that transcended the boundaries of music and sound mm. even and so they were working with psychologists and working with you know people in all sorts of different fields doing these types of yeah. um, activities in which you're, you're, you're working with people in real life in mm. different ways but in real life ways mm. so that people have the freedom to do what they want mm. and this was in the 60s that they, they began that stuff yeah, it's it's not a. It's so probably the history of this is, is older, mm -hmm. right? Do you know anything about? Yeah, so so I think um, I was thinking about this for the presentation as well, and it's like, um, I mean, where, where do you? It, it again, it comes down to like, if you let's say let's say you're going to talk about the history of like one to one performance, right? Then it's like, okay, well, what is one to one? You're trying to find out what is performance. Um, where do you, you know, is it the, the happenings in the 60s and 70s? You could say a lot of those, like, of course, it, they're kind of, they have this approach to them. They have a, a method. Um, but I mean, before that, like uh, someone giving a, you know, a piano concert to, to their neighbor or something, is, and they're having some sort of connection through that. I, I mean, um, it's really a question of, it's like, what is art? You know, it's like, where do you start and stop it? But I think this this kind of thinking is not really um, so kind of uh, prominent. I think as it as it could be in terms of audiences, audience engagement. You know, like the Inuit yeah. mm. from Alaska, they have the gambling mm. games where they're two people sitting face to face, and mm. you know they're they're doing this thing, and they're free to leave when they want, and mm. their audiences are not. Yeah. And they have, now they have competitions, but you know that's a very old thing. It's it's different, but. Mm. It's, it's kind of similar. Right? Yeah, yeah. So I think a, a lot of what I'm interested in is, is not necessarily, um, particularly using sound. It's not necessarily to to do something new and very different. It's more like how can you use technology and um, artistic methods to to get kind of connected in a in a deeper way. It doesn't mean that you can't connect in a deeper way in other ways. It doesn't mean that it's it's uh, it's totally new. But I think particularly now with um, the classic example is like people putting headphones on to walk down the street, you know, and, and they're they're having the soundtrack. They're having like a soundtrack to their lives, literally, because they're listening to the, these different tracks, Spotify playlists, or whatever. And um, when I've been working with binaural audio walks, a big part is having the sounds of where they are coming in. Wouldn't that be interesting if suddenly? Walking down New York City, there's three thousand people in the same block on both sides, right? And all of a sudden, all those headphones tune into the same sounds. Yeah. And they all were like, like, how would they react differently? Mm. Like, you know, the, before they're all tuned into their yeah. own thing, and then suddenly, you know, would they like begin to walk at the same rhythm, mm. or you know, whether it be on the beat or with the beat, or again? I mean, yeah. Uh, okay, that's yeah. What if we, is that possible? Yeah. Can we do that? Yeah. Can we do that to people? Can we get into their telephones? Well, I mean, sure, Google can. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not being serious. Oh, yeah, no, that's good. Uh, who's first? <laughs> yeah. uh, was it all three at the same time? No. <laughs> 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 all right, sorry. Uh, just. Maybe I'm getting ahead of your of your presentation, yeah. but do you have like any like golden mm. criteria for this one to one uh, idea? Yeah. I mean, I, I understand mm. it. Is it? Uh, mm. Sorry, my ignorance here, but I understand mm. it is like creating some kind of relationship mm. between the yeah. performer and the yeah. and the audience or interactor yeah, yeah. or, or whatever you want to call mm. it. Uh, but I mean, 
how how far yeah. I mean, it, it, there must be limits mm. because you, you can't have relationships with a crowd of 100,000 mm. people uh, easier with yeah. 10 or you can't, I don't know, uh, but yeah. uh, what's your yeah. kind of yeah, so so I think it's like um, I mean it's a it's a I mean this is really about how I'm thinking about this. It's like it doesn't mean that other people would work with one to one like this. This is more how how I'm uh, ex kind of explaining what I'm doing in my projects. But I think for me it's um, it's not so much about having one person at a time. It could be more. I think with the idea of people spectating or waiting, that's a bit uh, strange for, for for my thinking. But um, in term or counterproductive, I could say maybe to, to something that could be created. Um, doesn't mean that it, I, I might not make something like uh, like that where people are queuing and seeing. But um, I think for me, it's, it doesn't have to be like one person and an artist in a separate room. It could be a hundred thousand, but it's more like how do you work with those a hundred thousand? Or the idea of people? Do you? Do you do like a slightly different soundtrack for everyone, or does everyone get the same one? But you're recognizing that they might do something slightly different, or this song might mean something to this person in that crowd and not for everyone else. Yeah, you know? how do you just just have these questions? It's more about questions. Um, it's more like a process. Like how do you think about your um, go back to the word audience? <laughs> how do you think about your audience um, in that way? And how do you think about these aspects of um, do they need a toilet break? Is the room too cold? Um, have they found this place easily? Uh, like, what have they experienced beforehand? What is happening around us right now in this in the festival environment, for example? How are they going to feel afterwards? It's, it's kind of like a tuning in to those things rather than um, an assumption that they will come and they will have an experience, and this is the artwork, and then they leave. You know, it's it's more like um, uh, sort of finally tuning that connection as a really important part of the process of making the artwork. When, when, when you said that, Miguel, I was thinking that um, like at a soccer match, like at the World Cup, you know, you have 100,000 people in the mm. stadium and then uh, a guy scores mm. and then he goes and slaps hands with, with 10 guys who are in the stands, right? They, I don't know if they, they do that in American football, right? They, they like slap right, hands right. with the audience. Right. You know, oh, right. Right. And maybe they do that in the World Cup as well. Yeah. But in that way, it's like, hey, you with the yellow shirt. Yeah. Right? So, hey, yeah. oh, he slapped my hand. I'll never wash yeah. my hand for the next week. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then, and then some people might turn around and go, Oh, that was really, that really hurt. Bastards. Actually, that's, yeah. <laughs> I didn't want my hand, so I was just like putting my hand up, you know, and yeah, yeah. So that's it. That's what I find quite exciting. Is how, how do people respond to these things? And you know, what can you, what can you trigger? And the guy's holding a beer, right? Slap! Oh. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Do you want me? Yeah. Okay. But it's a little bit an extension of that because mm. I've been thinking about two s elements of this. Because in one way, it, are you not really mm. trying to establish a deeper connection in them? Mm. And maybe not between you and mm. them, but yeah. within them. Yeah. And that c goes back to the second thought, which has to do with the numbers, mm. one or many, that you are the one, in a way, becoming that octopus, that computer, mm. that psychotherapist, that kind of a super mm. person who is able to flexibly respond mm. to whatever comes at you. Yeah. There's really, really uh, good uh, thoughts because this is something that um, that I've also worked with, uh, and particularly, I mean, I've been talking a little bit more about performance, um, uh, but some of these examples you'll see, um, uh, Blackout, which I think, did you try Blackout? No, you didn't, did you? Mm, no. I, th I think I did actually, did the one in the back Yeah, here. you did try it, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh. So, so with, with some things like that, it's not really, it's quite an introspective experience for the audience. Um, of course, I'm still present because I made the sound recordings, chose the framework, uh, had the structure of it, all of that. So to say that I wouldn't be present in a way is, is false, uh, even if I wasn't in the room. Um, 
also with sound design I think uh, this is a pr an approach I take to that too um, so but I but you're absolutely right it's it's kind of I have this idea that um, and this isn't just my idea but it's like the more specific uh, you make something the more universal it can become uh, is something that I've been um, thinking about recently so um, what what I'm making is a lot of things that are like personally interesting to me or uh, something that I find could be um, like really like slowed down or like teased apart a little bit and and um, whole ideas could come from something quite simple and then I have the idea that if I find that interesting maybe other people could find that interesting and if I acknowledge that they might find that interesting then I can work with that together with them so in that case, yeah, it absolutely, because a lot of the things I'm doing, again, going back to the interactive thing, it's not so much about physical interaction, it's about what happens with them. Um, what, what kind of memories does it, could it pull out, or what kind of experiences could, could, it, could it have for, like, recall for them? Um, how would it affect them physically? So if we look at some examples now, then I can sort of talk about how people have responded quite differently. Um, that's a bit more concrete to see how, how this is but yeah it's really it's really um, it's not it's like the connection between the artwork and uh, and pers the person experiencing that and the connection between me and the person it's, it's like I mean um, they don't they don't, send, they don't send me Christmas cards afterwards <laughs> but they might be talking about the performance afterwards you know so it's, it's really about what's that what's that triggered in them uh, what's that kind of given them and how have they responded to that, to that specifically themselves yeah compared to someone else because you the one you were explaining the first mm. th that made you think about going down this road mm. there was nothing you were just you mm. in a room starting yeah. Yeah. to wonder and yeah that's yeah. interesting but i was sort of framing that in a, a way because i was speaking to them from from the end of this uh, corridor space in that mm. work yeah. um but yeah there was it's, it's it's allowing spaces for that too in the work so all of the works tend to have a space for people to have their own thoughts or their own like movements or their own like voice uh, in it as well and that's important to to have that um, you know it's like the, the, like it's a bit like you know the, the the gaps between the musical notes are just as important as the musical notes so it's like the things that I'm specifically giving uh, are as important as the bits that I'm not specifically giving or I'm just letting space for in a in a performance or sound design. So if we look at... Um, yes, I think... No, sorry. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. So my question is about how do you collect the feedback or the response from the audience? Mm. Because uh, I know you have two parts. Yeah. Two parts together with the, perform the actor and the yeah. performer. Because you were involved as well. Yeah. I was thinking about the blackout performance. Yeah. You were inside, so you, you were acting. Yeah same time of the actor inside, yeah. so you have to collect its response at the same time, mm. act. Mm. And then what happens after, mm. so if the person doesn't come to you and mm. doesn't speak with you about the performance, how, how do you yeah, collect that speech? Yeah, yeah that's uh, also something that I've tried to think about a lot. Um, because a lot of the time, um, people just go actually, and uh, and if I've made something in a, like this one I was talking about with the, with the just with the, the torch, uh, this is the bit when I got the cowboy hat on. So so they're given this torch and they're like allowed to explore the space and then they they they're shown out. I stay in the room so and I'm already in there when they come in. They're shown in by, by someone else. So uh, I don't, I don't, I hear about it afterwards from like the gallery staff or something or whoever's been helping me. Um, and it's only if like someone I know is there or if I come out and it's like the last performance before lunch and I come out and there's someone there and they want to talk but actually the, the thing is um, often uh, in my projects people don't want to talk afterwards to me sometimes they do, sometimes they don't um, they might want to talk to each other sometimes people want to just have some space themselves I've heard that some people want to take a walk afterwards perhaps or they might want to sit in the gallery just by themselves thinking um, so again it's like this kind of it's hard to have one way to collect feedback on that, and it's and it's n not something you can easily put into words either. So um, when I, because uh, I do get asked, <laughs> people experience my works, 
the only thing I can really say is like, there's a certain look that people tend to have. Like, it's as if like <laughs> something which sounds really stupid, but like, it's like something has happened that's quite meaningful and deep, but they are still like processing it maybe, or they're like um, happy. <laughs> I think. Um, Finish yeah. <laughs> yes, no, I'm gonna. No, this is why I'm not an actor. This is uh, yeah. I can do my own stuff. Yeah. I'll, I don't, I don't want to risk ridiculing. It. But no, it's um. So it is hard. So so what I have done is like on things where I've been trying out an idea. I've been uh, I have done the whole like question and answer thing because I really got to a point where I had to find out more concretely what people were thinking about it. It was like quite important. So I did do that, and I, and I, and I kind of made it clear that you didn't have to do it, um, but people actually wanted to. But some of them would straight away, and some of them wouldn't. And you could tell actually in the answers they were giving that, that some of them were still like, as you said, I'm, I'm still processing this. I'll, I'll be able to write better in a week or something. So, um, so it's uh, I, I mean I got I can get like what those people said, and I can and it's um, it was very like nice feedback, like really interesting responses, and like very positive. But um, but at the same time, I'm deliberately working with things that can't be put into words so easily. So it's also very hard to expect that to give a full picture of it. Like if someone read all that feedback, you wouldn't really know what people have gone through. So so what I sometimes find is it's like uh, I have to sometimes rely on people who who've experienced the work to actually explain my work to other people because I can't really describe it very well. Um, and and people who've seen the same work, they have a way of. <laughs> relating to each other and it can be quite hard f for, for people as well to describe it because it's so much is like this internal um, processing or like this internal response of, of work but if we look at some just to to show some things um, so this is the one we're, we're talking about this is a picture from the yeah sure yeah and we were uh, <coughs> And we just passed two, so I went to... <laughs> so we just passed two o'clock, so I won't spend so long with the products, but just to give you an idea about the kind of things, um, how I'm putting these thoughts into practice. So um, some of you have experienced blackout, uh, so maybe you should explain this. But, <laughs> but basically, um, this is a it's, a, it's a... it's maybe a one-to-one -one performance, it's maybe a sound installation, it's a thing. Um, and uh, it's in complete darkness um, for about 15, lasts about 15, 20 minutes. And basically there's um, one audience member at a time, of course. Uh, okay. They come, they meet me, and they're given a pair of headphones with a tracking device on top and a stereo uh, receiver, audio receiver. And uh, I explain that this is the equipment and what it does and what I'm putting on them. And I explain that the work is going to be in complete darkness. Um, and that I will be in the room with them, so if there's any problems, they can just call out and I can get the lights and everything. I think that's about it, actually. Is that all I say? Maybe? Yeah. Exactly. yeah. <laughs> I think I say hello as well. Um, <laughs> and then we, then we go together around, uh, I actually did it in the room just here, the back room. We go, go together to the, to, the, to the entrance. Do they know where you are? No. Okay. They, they could do, but they don't ever look behind. It's interesting. So, so the audio starts. We're standing next to each other. I start the audio uh, from my phone, and we're both, and I'm listening to the same audio. And then, uh, then I then I told them that there's a chair in the center of the room. Actually, that's the thing. So then the audio starts. It's a voiceover. Then they, it's um, they basically when that is done, they're going to be show. I show them in, and I just wait. Then they go in. And they take a seat on the chair, and uh, this is what I mean. So I actually come in behind them, and I'm not right behind them. I'm standing by the door. But they don't, it's like from that moment it's framed and I, I've not had anyone yet look behind them to see where I am. Um, uh, so then I shut the door, they sit on the chair and the lights, there's a bit of light on the chair, it goes down. And then it's basically all driven through sound. So they're hearing voiceover, um, different field recordings. Uh, this is uh, spatial field recordings. So, um, so some things from that could be from outside the building, some things that are like a uh, the, the sea, um, different kind of contacts, different environments, and it's really about um, them focusing inwards and having space to explore. In a way, it's, it, again, it's really hard to describe, so I'm not going to attempt to do much more than that. But um, there's some touch-based interaction that corresponds. So I have a little video. I can just explain 
a bit as well that makes a bit more sense. But essentially, the, the, the idea of the work in a global sense um, is sort of looking at object permanence, the idea that babies, when they don't see their parents in front of them, they don't realize that they still exist. It's thinking about sound. How do we, if we um, hear something but we don't see it, do we, we think it's happening? Um, if we don't hear something, um, is it still existing? So it's like playing a little bit with these different sounds from elsewhere and thinking about what's happening around them at the moment and what do they imagine because they can't see anything. So so is this room, where is this room? And a lot of the times they don't know the room as well. So it's it's like they don't know how big the room is, how small it is. So it's exploring that as well, like the physical space they're in. Like they don't know this, or at least not in this context. So it's really everything's open. Just imagine you just listening to different sounds. They can move if they want, or they have to stay sitting. Yeah, so they can move if they want. So they start seated, and then they they they, they can instructed to to stand up, and then they're basically told this is your space. Um, some people move, some people don't. Um, it's a bit difficult if they do move because they could bump to a wall. Um, but there's this point where they actually are um, told to follow a sound, which is my my voice. So they're following my my voice around the room, which is um, actually recorded in an analog chamber with the ambisonic reverb of the specific space. So it sounds like it's in the room. And then I'm exploring this idea of sounds can come from different places to their source. So okay. while they're hearing this idea and they're hearing my voice, uh, I'm moving around differently around them. So, oh, Did you have any difficulties recording in the ambisonic space? In uh, the, the impulse responses or the yeah, because you recorded your voice in the... Oh, in an anechoic chamber. I'm sorry, yeah, 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 yeah. Did I have difficulties Any with Any difficulties? Um, Did you sing an octave, for instance? <laughs> I didn't have any difficulties. It was I, I enjoyed it a lot. I've been in them a few times. but um, inside jokes there, right? Yeah. But, um, but the south noise of the microphone was a bit difficult to work with. Because <laughs> there's nothing else in there. Yeah. There's a well-known soprano who couldn't sing an octave in the anechoic chamber. Yeah. I won't say what it was. No one in this room, right? Yeah. But um yeah, this is the this is how it starts on the on the chair and you can see the, the headphones and the tracking device, which are this here, just if you're curious. So this is the, the headphones they have, and then this is a battery and then a tracking device that measures orientation, which way they're facing the room. And also within 10, 10 centimeters accuracy, where they are physically in the room, oh. so the sounds can be mapped to. Uh, they can look around in the sounds. Some of them. Um, it's also object-based sounds, so they can uh, move around. Yeah, these lights are left own, and um, and also it's like the lighting can be mapped to where they are. And um, why the tracking device? Were you recording the data? I'm I'm using it in real time to to have the like ambisonic content. It has this is the head tracking for that. Yeah. Got it. Okay. So 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 the sounds are like fixed in place. Uh, it's not in the physical room, but yeah. let's say there's always like the bus that goes past in uh, the f one of the recordings would always be in this place in the room, so that I know that when they hear my voice, it's going to be here. So they're going to move this direction if they follow it, and it's going to be here. Then it's going to be so it's it's a kind of calibration way so that I know everyone will have the sound sources coming from the same place in space when they start. Um, and th was there a Doppler effect then on the bus? Uh, not with this, because no, the sounds that were mapped to the room, it was just my voice, actually. Oh. It was only object-based in the end. Yeah. Um, but I could if I wanted to. If, if, if one of those sources had been moving pretty fast, I would put it on. But uh, actually, the voices were static. They were just jumping in position. So yeah, but you you could do that. This is running in uh, real time through a Max MSP patch. Tim, could you um, or have you thought of exhibiting this movement of the the uh, you know to other members of audience? Uh, do you mean so while oh to show it? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, that's our thing too. Yeah, uh -huh. I, I thought about it, but I think it comes back to this idea that people. Um, I, I think I would rather people were not aware of being filmed or I didn't do it if they weren't aware. Well, not filming them, but in terms of, you know, if you said the tracking device, then mm -hmm. you could see the dot. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
So yeah. it's like a, almost like a coordinate system that yeah. you follow. Yeah, you could, you, you could, you could, you could, you could do that absolutely. But I think for, again, for me, it's like I kind of like the the ephemerality of it. Mm. You know, I like the fact that I know I know how people will respond, but um, or like a bit. I mean, I can kind of remember, and and you see traces of them when they leave because they lie down at one point. So there's wherever they're going to lie down. I I have a thermal imaging camera so I can see where they are. Uh, so I put a, a pillow under their head mm -hmm. and it's always interesting to because I forget where I am in the room I can see them but I can't necessarily see the room so well so then when I when I come back in afterwards and I turn the lights on I see the, the pillow on the floor <laughs> and I'm like oh that's where we ended up oh, yeah so um, like it. <laughs> it's good I encouraged it <laughs> yeah <laughs> but she's also experienced this, so yeah. So, so yeah. So I think you, you could map it, but again, I think it, for me, it's like a deliberate act uh, to keep it in this space, in this room, and just to kind of give them that space, actually, uh, without thinking of other people. So um, yeah. But I have um, this video here. So this is a. So this is like from from my camera. Okay. I have this thermal imaging camera, so I can see the other person. Um, it's just a short, <laughs> just a short like clip of it. So this is directly from where I'm looking, what I'm seeing. So which is a bit why it's bad camera work because I'm trying to look for certain things so I know where to uh, interact with them. And this is a part where um, they're they're sort of reaching out to to try and uh, feel where my voice is coming from, and um, they're basically hearing. It's hard to describe so much, but it's like a imagine like a, a sort of like a, uh, like a window of sound. Uh, so it's silent everywhere apart from this kind of uh, shape of sound, and within that shape, it's a, it's a bit spatial. So if they have with the head tracking, that means if they turn this way, it's it's saying fixed in the space. It's like I guess I think of it like a sci-fi film. You know, it's like a portal opening up, but it's, it's that's what I've done with the sound, and and so it's in one direction. They're reaching out towards it. And they're feeling some breeze, some wind coming towards them from this beach. It's like a, it's a beach sound of the, the rough sea. So I'm kind of getting, uh, moving um, and getting some air to touch their fingertips. So let's see. It's almost sensory virtual reality. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of virtual reality without the visuals, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry. But not, not, not in uh, COVID times. <laughs> For the ears. That was a fan, yeah. really. So they're being, this part is the, they can start to look down at their hands and to see if they know where their hands are without seeing them. Like how do they know where their body is? Um, what do their hands look like? But this is in, uh, yeah, this is in total darkness. Um, Sophia can't see it, her hands uh, at all. It's just following the audio instructions. You know, the crazy thing about this project is that if it's an art project, you don't need to get human subject approval for this. But if it's mm -hmm. a research project, you actually have to go through mm -hmm. this formal process at the university yeah. to do it. Yeah. My, my final degree project, actually, I had um, I did a one-to-one -one experience in uh, the Black Box Theatre at Bristol University. And it was in, um, uh, I don't have it up here, actually, in the, the slides, but it was in, uh, you'll find it on my website, but it's... Uh, I was in swimming trunks, and the audience would get changed in the in a changing booth in the theatre into their swimming costume, and then it was kind of replicating this idea of going down to the sea and back. So there was a big pool of water in the middle of the black box mm -hmm. stage area. There was like a projection behind and above, and they were listening on headphones. At some point, I actually used the theatre speakers, and it was like echoing this idea of going to the beach, probably a British beach where it's quite cold. The water was very cold, <laughs> and um, and going into the water, uh, getting changed, going to the water. Yeah coming back out to changing booth and you know you, while you've been in the water you've sort of had this, these like memories of like nostalgia of like oh I should really like this water because this is like so cool to be doing this and then it's also like I'm actually quite cool but it but it, linking that with memories of water and um, they had to have a, a meeting with the lecturers because it was my final assessed degree project ah. on this uh, practice piece they had to actually had to have a special meeting to see if it was okay for lecturers to be alone in a black box theatre with a student in their swimming costumes because we were also dancing uh, together to uh, Edith Piaf's Non Je Ne Rien <laughs> with, with a shower actually in the water so um, so it was quite intimate in a way but also but um, yeah they had to have a meeting about it to get it I wonder what could go wrong yes. yeah 
Well, luckily nothing for me, and I, got, I, I passed my degree. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's uh, yeah, this is the thing is, you, if you have an idea, you want to try this stuff. Yeah. So um, yeah, but this was so that was back up just to give you a quick uh, example. This is um, another project that I'm currently working on. So no one has really experienced this yet because it's it's not been finished. But um, I've been going up to Arbisco in the north of Sweden. I think quite a few of you know about this. But Miko probably has no idea. So uh, um, I, I basically had funding to go to a um, place called Arbisco, um, which is right yeah right at the top of Sweden, inside the Arctic Circle. And um, I established a collaboration with the research station up there. Mm -hmm. And at the research station as part of uh, Umeå University, which is called the Climate Impacts Research Center. So they're interested in, um, of course, climate research, but also in um, how to um, maybe through art projects, maybe through more scientific projects, but how to engage the public in an understanding of the importance of climate issues. So the collaboration has been that basically they've, that's why I'm still alive here. Uh, I've made five trips up there and um, I've been camping uh, by myself in a, in a, in a tent through, through five different periods across 12 months. Um, so the temperatures were ranging from like 15 degrees down to like minus 27, I think, to centigrade. And um, centigrade, okay. Uh, yeah, Celsius. Yeah. So, um, uh, and uh, in December there was like very little. Uh, there was no direct sunlight. It was just coming around the curvature of the Earth. Um, and then in the in the summer it was like the midnight sun. It just didn't go down. So it's been uh, quite fun. <laughs> and then I've been up there making um, different ambisonic uh, sound recordings. Uh, this is my tent from. February actually and um, so I'll be making different sound recordings in different weather conditions and also they when the water is running there's been a mountain stream I've been at this, the same location every time to see how it changes over the seasons and I've also been doing some underwater hydrofoam recordings as well wow. nice. so if we just look at some I thought this would be some nice pictures to put up are there wolves or bears up there or anything or? Uh, I apparently there, there, are, there are possibly some bears I found out on one of the later trips but I didn't see any luckily yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. so so I was out there for like between three to five nights on each trip by myself um, and then I had uh, the help of the research station to, to get me out there and, and collect me and to keep in contact so they drove you or something or? no we had to hike yeah. so um, having had no experience I had to learn how to snowshoe and then we were snowshoed like, or I snowshoed 8 kilometers. So how long was the, how long did it take you to get there to that location? It took uh, between like I'd say between one and a half and four hours oh, depending okay. on the weather. That's yeah. Bad. Well yeah, mm -hmm. I, I think it's bad. No it's like yeah. it's a lot of um, no, it, it was basically a bit difficult for the first two thirds on the way up and then the last third was quite steep uh, and when that snow was quite heavy and you have a I mean, I was carrying the, the equipment bag, and that was like 17, 18 kilograms, yeah. and that that was for me that was a bit heavy. But um, but the the yeah the people who are helping me they're used to being out in this terrain. Yeah. They they could carry like 30 kilogram sure. packs and stuff. Um, but we did it with a with a pull cut with a sledge, and they they would be on uh, skis when we're going out. But I can't ski, so we didn't actually get to me learning. We just uh, I had to do the snowshoe thing, which was fun, yeah. but. Um, except for a few times <laughs> but, but when I when I was found it very hard to keep going back to yeah. civilization afterwards. How long when you would go up there you mm. were there for how many days before you went to the camp? Uh, none uh, like, like oh. some, some later trips I changed a bit but uh, I, like the, the December one I had to stay a night in a, a tourist station because we the train was delayed and it was too dangerous to go up when I got there too late yeah. too, too uh, late in the evening. And what's but the elevation? I think there it was about 600 meters. 600 meters. Yeah, okay. yeah. Um, and then I, I think at one point I went up to 800 meters on a, on a, on a Friday evening hike. But, uh, but mostly I tended to stay around the area because we wanted to document that, that place. And there was, uh, the scientist collaborator chose that spot so I'd have a lot of variety in, in sounds I could record. So this was kind of daily life um, when I was there, like heating up water, cooking these uh, freeze dried food. Uh, which I really liked to start with and then I couldn't wait to get a sandwich afterwards. Uh, this is, uh, the, 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 while well, it was called a mountain stream, but I, I, I would say that's more of a torrent of 
<laughs> a massive amount of water flowing. <laughs> so this is where I was recording the, the underwater sounds. And uh, this is the helicopter that had to come and check on me <laughs> in December. <laughs> so yeah, so that was a bit weird. I had, um, uh, I, I basically said, I think in the December trip, it, it was it got a bit, I'd basically, there weren't many sounds to record, I'd, I'd recorded everything. And I just asked, they were gonna come and collect me in the six o'clock that evening. And uh, you know, and at nine o'clock in the morning, I was like, if I'm totally honest, I'm not really enjoying this now. I'm like, I've done the sound recording. It's, it's very cold. Every morning my clothes are literally like, frozen and I'm having to put them on and um, and, I, and the, it was the food the food did it for me I was just like I really just want like a sandwich or something it's like the, the, you know I, I would have yeah that was that was that was my you know dream was just for some fresh bread actually um, so I just said in the morning I was like I'm totally fine don't you know I didn't want to worry them at all and I said yeah, is there any possibility I could come back a bit earlier um, but they were being very conscientious and careful they basically sent a helicopter to check on me so so I had like no human contact for three days. Um, it had been mostly dark apart from these short periods like this where you could see the, the sun coming around, this kind of pink, bluey sky uh, for a little bit before it went totally dark again. And then I just hear this helicopter coming in and within like a minute it's landed next to me and this um, person jumps out and comes over and just asks me, are you all right? <laughs> it was like a one-to-one -one performance to me. And uh, are you all right? And I, I said, well, yeah, I'm, I'm, like, I'm okay. And uh, and basically, they could take me back right now in the helicopter, or but not with my stuff. And then, later, and I was like, I'll stay here because they're going to come and get me. And it's like, you know, I have to pack everything away. So, so they they went, and then later on, um, I got picked up. But the scientist that I was collaborating with, basically, later he told the helicopter people later, he was like, I'm not surprised he's quite attached to his his expensive sound equipment. So I'm not surprised he didn't uh, <laughs> leave about it. Yeah. Well, I guess it's also. The concern is that they have to protect you against yourself in some cases because you yeah. might not know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's the main the main danger. When I was talking to them on one of the trips up, it's like the main danger there is yourself actually, um, and just taking risks. So, so they're very good at like pointing out what is you know don't really go down to the water because uh, when it's with the snow because you don't know it's all definitely frozen underneath. Yeah. And actually in December when it was like yeah minus twenty five one evening. And I was out there, and it's it's so silent. And in the summer, the the, the sound of the water is, is really loud. So it's like this. It's almost like the sea when you go to sleep, and uh, you can hear it in the many of the sound recordings that I put into the installation from this. But in the winter, it was totally quiet except for this very like it's like glassy sound. I was like, what's that? And I was recording, and it's basically even in those temperatures, a bit of water flowing through the ice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if you go down on the snow and you don't realise, you can go into it and be carried under. So. Um, so you have to be quite careful. So I, I did a lot of um, yeah. research and listening to, to what they were when saying. When I was a teenager, I, w I went under uh, the ice mm. a couple of times. Mm. And once was on a snowmobile, and it was yeah. very hard to get up. Yeah. Yeah, we could have died in that case. Is in Wisconsin, it gets cold. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, uh, you have to take it yeah. Yeah, sensibly. So, um, and as I wasn't really used to this, I took it quite carefully. Yeah. But um, anyway, I made it back. So, um, yeah. so, <laughs> and you did too. But this is a this is a selfie in this now. This is me, yeah. So this is me in my uh, my kind of super warm uh, clothing. That's a cool picture, dude. Yeah, I know it's quite. Uh, I kind of like it. <laughs> so this is when I was recording. I, I basically had one uh, day. I, I was on the last trip in February. Um, I was going up there and they were saying, "Is there anything you you, you want to record that you haven't recorded yet?" And I say, "Well." Part of this project is to record what's here, right? It's it's not really about that. But of course you start to go, oh, I'd quite like to have this. And I'm saying, I hadn't really got any like really kind of cool like wind, you know? Um, and then, you know, it's like, of course, be careful what you wish for. So I was like, you know, hopefully I, re I really like that to happen. And then um, one day it starts getting windy, gets quite windy, gets really windy. And then uh, I'm just like, of course, this is the time. So I go outside. And I mean, it's, it's really like, it's almost like bl blowing the microphone and me over. It's like getting quite strong and there's snow like kind of whipping up. Um, and I was just, you know, I was in the zone. I was like, this is really cold, but uh, this sounds so cool. You know, I'm loving this. So I recorded loads of it, went back to the tent. And, uh, and then what I'd forgotten was that I'd only half built a snow wall to protect the tent from the snow. So I go back and like half the tent is just like a mountain of snow. So then I'm like, 
try and manage to get, I managed to get into the tent, put the equipment in, and then I spend like another hour at midnight, like shoveling yeah. snow out of the out of the tent. So um, yeah, so that's like it's a bit different to recording uh, uh, in other places. So this is the how it's going to be. So this is I was developing it in the black room here uh, before summer. So um, it's going to be done as um, an eight speaker uh, setup with the tent that I stayed in, and the audience will go in. Uh, will visit. Will go in one at a time. Yeah, they will go into the tent. They will lie down. They'll have this immersive experience of these sounds I've recorded. And in this work, uh, we're talking about interaction again. Um, they will have an EEG headband, which will monitor their brain uh, frequencies. EEG. Um, oh. Yeah, yeah. I've forgotten the exact full name. But you know, yeah. It's like um, here. It's yeah. It's here. It's around. Yeah. So this means that you can basically map that data in real time. So if they're, uh, for example, very relaxed, then you can start to have certain weather coming on top of that. Or if they're very uh, unfocused or focused, then you can start to to use that. So this is a way for me to explore climate change. The idea of this project is to explore climate change through. These kind of immersive practices, this one-to-one -one methodology that I'm exploring, how you can reach people individually, um, and you can have this idea that people have shared um, shared experiences you can build on. So, um, could I ask you a question about yeah, that? Yeah, sure. So, when you talk about uh, kind of tracking climate change, mm. then you need to be able to show some sort of change. Or climate change, yeah. So, what what were you showing? The, the audio. Oh, you mean in this uh, installation? Yeah. Or, oh, oh, mm. you mean in, in mm. general? <laughs> yeah. In in this project, it's it's basically the, the 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 main core of it is the the tent, the actual installation part. Yeah. So this is kind of there's no like um, there'll be a little bit of information about what it is, but but there's no kind of they'll know that the sounds come from this one place. Uh, and they're actually like recorded by me in this uh, place that's uh, in, inside the Arctic Circle, and they they're going to change the, the the weather effectively of this space that they're feeling as if they're in, inside by their um, through their their thought process through their brain mm -hmm. activity. So it's basically creating a link between them and this recreated environment. So according yeah. to how the data comes through mm -hmm. the through the sensors, yeah. That that will change the sound in some ways. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Okay. So so it's kind of trying to create a link between um, the individual and these um, okay. these elements. Is this, this environment? That's because being my first thought was, oh, okay, so mm -hmm. you're comparing mm -hmm. what you recorded then mm -hmm. with the sound fifty years ago. No. No. Yeah. Because it's because I wanted to record it in a specific yeah. format. Yeah. Um, yeah. Four channel or eight channel? It's going to be eight channels. From from Amazon content, yeah. So then, uh, and it's also some some lighting effects and a wind machine. Too. So it's um, so I'm interested when I work with immersive technology. I have this idea that um, it, I, I've seen it happen. Actually, it's more effective sometimes to work with certain sensory stimuli and then to not have others. So when I work with darkness, that's because I think when you have a lot of um, immersive sound, it can be more powerful. To it's like the thing about know radio has the best pictures it's that same idea like if you if you try and fill in everything um, you you come across the technological limits quite quickly but if you have something that's in discrepancy. yeah it's discrepancy exactly and, it, and if you, you um, try to it's either it's kind of interesting in itself but it's also something that you can go into more with, with your own uh, imagination in a way so that's that's how I'm I think about this. so this will be a dark room uh, with a light inside the tent um, and they'll be lying in, and it, it, we can see a little video of um, what it looks like. Uh, do, you, do you have a picture of the sound machine, of the, of the wind machine? Not in here, but I can show you later. Yeah, if you, uh, or maybe next time I bring it, you can check it out. Curious. Yeah, yeah. It's just speak just on the speakers here. But so, this, so the wind machine is active, and this is uh, one of the recordings I made in February, and this is the lighting uh, effect as well. And the wind machine is by the windows. Yeah, it's kind of in the corner in the room, so it's um, yeah, sort of that way. So it's more. Yeah, denim. Um, this is outside. So, so yeah. this is kind of uh, mm. uh, explore how you can trigger some instinctive uh, stress or something. 
Yeah. <laughs> well, this is kind of really about like um, people kind of going inside this tent and make a connection between. Uh, I mean, actually, specifically looking at the south of Sweden and the north of Sweden because there's a huge difference in landscape, and um, and it's very different here in Malmö compared to up there. So part of it is like looking at that that contrast. So you know, r rather than trying to m make a work up there and get everyone up, it's more like let's give a, a taste of this and let's also think about th th how I was there and how what I experienced and what I recorded. So part of it is that, and then it's also looking at how to think about the climate without text, without information, because we all learn differently. So it's like, if I have these recordings that um, that are interesting and, uh, and evolving enough in themselves, then people will have this experience where they're feeling, hopefully, closer to the environment. And if they know that they are affecting it, and they're not getting the same experience every time, depending on who's going in, maybe they think afterwards that they have this uh, they have a different approach to, to their um, level of um, influence I guess on uh, these bigger kind of issues so this is like the um, this is the first collaborate like art and science collaboration I've done and this was really looking at these methods that I'm working with and seeing could they work uh, not in just a kind of art context with my uh, my kind of concepts but could they work in a in a bigger sense, in, in something that's more like um, uh, something where like this, it's they have a problem where they can't reach a lot of people effectively to talk to them about, you know, it's like you, you can shout at someone that this climate change is real, it's it's really affecting, but not everyone will listen and not everyone will want to respond. Some people actually like negatively respond to, to being told things. So this is an idea that if you work with immersive technology and you try to create these connections with people individually, Maybe this is a, a, a useful thing for working with concepts such as climate change. It's a different approach uh, to that, but um, could this be a useful way for people to feel more connected to nature and more um, responsible for it? Yeah. So it's really a hypothesis. It's really like a, a test um, of this. You, s you said something, and I just want to understand it correctly. You said how so that the person who is experiencing the work would be aware of how they um, are participating in climate change. What uh, did you yeah. mean by that? No, I think I mean they will be um, they'll be aware that they're able to influence the work. Um, in, which, in which way? Through 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 wearing this wearing a headband, and they'll they'll know that that will that can change the the weather in the installation. And yeah. how is that? How, how is that done? Just. I'm not sure I understand that. Uh -huh, okay, so um, so they wear this headband. So when they lie down, they have a headband put on them, and they'll know uh, beforehand that it's again the same thing with like a blackout. It's like I don't want to put technology on people without explaining what it is yeah. and what it's for. Uh, going back to this idea of like, you, like people are good enough to try something, so I want to also not make people like, oh my god, what is this? Um, so it's a way of also doing that, but. They will know that this is uh, something that they can influence. So I think it's also something they can play with. Like if they want to try and calm down, they can change the weather. So it's trying to create. It's about creating a link between their 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 kind of thinking in a, in a in a very like broad sense because you know it's it's registering kind of levels of anxiety or focus in a way and levels of relaxation. What but exactly is it measuring? Is it measuring blood flow? Is it measuring perspiration? Is it measuring it's brain it's waves? A, it's a brainwave frequency. Yeah. Brainwave frequency. Yeah. Yeah. Frequency. Mm. Okay. Mm. yeah. So it's like the electromagnetic. And is this, is there a correspondence mm. between, let's say, um, anxiety mm. or anger with coldness and wind, or you know, yeah. <laughs> is it in that sort of register of yeah. translation? So, so, so this is like because it's not been finished developed yet. So this is something I'm going to be testing. Is like. To what because you, in a way you've got like a kind of feedback loop because mm. you you have like the sound being triggered off one state but then maybe the sound will go into another state so you know so what where does the influence come in strongly or like how does it and probably what will happen is that when people come in there's maybe it's more like their own response yes. to that situation and then later it's more like you know a bit like how people come out of my works with a certain like calmness or something it's a probably likely that they'll start to go into more 
uh, people will share the same sort of brain frequency range at the end. But I don't know. This is also like to, this is part of the next bit of testing. But um, but the idea is that it will respond to to that. That's a difficult research question because there are mm. so many different subjective responses. Yeah. Depending on culture, depending on the type mm. of person they are. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. So many variables that yeah that would be difficult. Exactly, and I mean for, for this, it's like it's um, pretty interesting. Yeah, it's it's more about like having. Uh, I mean, probably how it will be done in this in the end is like you just have different thresholds, and then certain sounds get triggered. And maybe it's a sound sequence. Um, think, uh, like for example, going into the water and, and under the water and, and out. So it's it's something that's. Um, I have a structure uh, or different structures in mind, but it's something that I'm going to play with a bit in the next bit. But how would that relate to real life then? If mm -hmm. you were if. I mean, could this be something that could be applied to people who are hikers mm. who are going up mountains and yeah. they could use the technology to help them relax or mm. what are the types of... Well, the, the, the technology itself, I mean, the, the EEG technology, it's, it's uh, the headband I've got is actually used by a meditation app company. That's the, oh, They've wow. made it a meditation app. Company, yeah. So, so they use it actually, so you can kind of like uh, it's like a progress thing. You can see how like um, much you, uh, how how good your meditation is in a way. Or like, so, so it's used more like that. So it's kind of um, so that they use sort of more like meditation purposes, and then more like uh, scientific research. So, um, so this is kind of where the, the the main thing, and and some kind of interaction stuff that that you can get these uh, devices made for for. Um, Bit of research as well, yeah. so um, but this is just to as a way of like taking data and starting to have the individual person responding in a way that's relevant to what I want to do with the project, which is to have people have an experience where they start to think about uh, what they can affect um, and be a bit closer to nature. And so, you think a real world application would be not in nature itself, but for people who want to have a certain type of experience. Artificial experience. You mean with this uh, yeah, this yeah, specific? Yeah. I I, I, I'm, I think it's it's quite open actually. I think it could go to different. Um, I mean, one thing is it could be done in Obisco because there's a lot of tourists going up there who don't go that far into it, and they don't necessarily think about the scientific aspects. Yeah. They're just all about the tourism and the you know photos and the, the hiking challenges and stuff like that. So I think there's a de yeah definitely a big um, uh, potential there. Um, and also, in it can be in science context, it can be in art context, it can yeah. be in like political context. So I think the work is is again, it's not really it's like a science museum. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, yeah. Tim, it's interesting. Ten years ago, or something, I had a hypothesis because I was working with uh, moods, and uh, I was making the analogy that if everything is, it was the premise was that if everything is energy, mm. which it is, then. The, let's say that the the heat of anger mm. will affect basically the coldness of the world, mm. and so, and through there are these uh, meditations where you have to experience you have to experience cold even if you don't, and you have to experience heat even if you don't, mm. and so I was kind of thinking that let's see that let's say that all these um, violences that is happening all over the world is creating a kind of heat which is mm. enabling this kind of climate change you know in terms of melting the ice and stuff mm. but of course uh, it, it's a bit yeah, in yeah. on what you are saying yeah. i think yeah yeah i think it's yeah i think it's like thinking about um your your presence i guess as a as a, as a human and, and yeah 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 yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah race yeah. or um, yeah. energy or something that yeah. affects yeah you know, these different structures in both yeah. geology and biology mm. yeah it's very interesting. yeah and I mean w working with climate it's also like you know this the, the thing is I, I was staying there you know I mean it's also I, I had to go in that environment and therefore I would have had an impact on that environment just by going there I mean I took the train up there but you know that's still I was part of um, electric usage on the train and you know there were things where I, I got something and there's no recycling at, that, at a certain place you know so so there's also that as well um, but the idea is to really connect people to, to nature in a, in a uh, specific uh, way again on this really? individual way yeah, yeah. so um, well just to uh, round off yeah. um, so leading from that pr project um, I, I've been uh, quite curious with this uh, art and science uh, collaboration. 
Um, yeah, we're running a little bit over, so I'll just be a bit speedy. But um, I was part of an ESS residency, um, and um, as part of that, there were seven uh, artists who were selected to work in this residency, and it was arranged by ESS, the European Spallation Source, which is they're building basically a massive particle accelerator, like a super powerful microscope. Is my uh, <laughs> small description of it. <clears throat> I, I did have a lot of uh, knowledge uh, about it, but um, I'm not very good at repeating the knowledge very well. But we basically had, um, it was an online thing um, last year, end of last year. So it was during the pandemic, end of the pandemic. And um, the idea was to pair artists with scientists or engineers working at ESS and just to have conversations and see what could happen from the kind of cross pollination of mixing these different people and different ideas and approaches. But we all got a bit further than, than they expected. So we all wanted to make something. And I was the one who happened to be based in, uh, I'm, I, I'm based in Lund, which is the same place as ESS. And um, I was also uh, able to meet with, with the person I had not just online, we actually met up outside ESS and walked around outside. And I had this idea to go in inside and record uh, the sound of uh, the particle accelerator, which basically means similar to the technique I used in, in Blackout, I was wanting to create, uh, record the uh, impulse response um, measurements of the different spaces so that I could use it later for people to um, use have sound that, that could appear as if it was coming from those specific spaces because every acoustic space has a very unique sound uh, and I was like what is kind of cooler than a particle accelerator <laughs> or in this picture the target which is where yeah. the proton beam will be smashed sure. yeah. so that space there is the target in which um, uh, a, a neutron or proton will be shot from about the uh, distance of about 300 meters. Uh, 600, I think. Uh, uh, yeah, is it, yeah. Is so it it's like about 300 or uh, three uh, football fields away. Yeah. And they shoot it down down uh, a, a line, a pipe, a tubing, and it'll smash against uh, this target you know, here, which is yeah. that thing. So it's, it's not all uh, installed, but it's, it's basically. There, yeah. It's basically like a big thing that spins around with little fins on it, and then it's like the the beam yeah. hits it and smashes off, yeah. and then it's redirected down these. Uh, yeah. These in uh, I think it's these channels here. They're not all opened yet, but they're going to be down. Yeah. And then and I we have about ten different ten yeah. different lines to shoot into. Yeah. And then that beam is used to to image certain things. Yeah. We should have someone from ESS explaining this bit. But uh, but basically, it's a massive concrete space. But this space here is. Um, it's going to be closed off because it's going to be so radioactive that um, when it's functional, which I think it's maybe right now, it's uh, no one is going to be allowed to go in there. 2025. 25. But I think maybe they're testing it sooner. I'm not sure. Oh, yeah, yeah, we'll be testing yeah, yeah. it up till then. Yeah. yeah. So, the, the, so basically, the, the possibility to record the sound of this space was a very unique thing because it's now going to be just robots in there. So, um, But now you can actually, the work I've made, you can hear your voice in there. Or any music you want to, or awesome. a, a cat sound, whatever, yeah, and it'll sound like it's coming from in that space because it's the actual uh, acoustics of that space. So this is me up here uh, with the microphone um, recording. I, I think I look quite bad in a hard hat, but uh, I thought for the interest of showing you stuff, I should do it. <laughs> this is me at the bottom uh, with my. Leave that to the rest of us. Yeah. <laughs> this is the this thing at the speaker at the bottom. Um, and this is this is I hate this picture of me, but uh, but if we look at this is actually the end of the accelerator. So this is um, they haven't connected the beam yet, but right at the back here you can see where the proton beam is going to go through about 15 meters of concrete, uh, and that it ends up in that space. So it just was that big cylinder. So actually the the speaker here, um, when I was doing it, it's good when you do this measurement to have a music signal as well, so you can compare the, the actual reverb measurement later with by putting the same music track through it as the one you actually recorded with the same setup. Uh, and I played uh, Paranoid with Black Sabbath. And playing it here, nice. basically if you know a speaker design, you have this like reflex port that uh, Im improves the bass response, like a big uh, tube in a way. Or I'm not so good at explaining that either. But basically th th this uh, 15 meter long <laughs> tunnel here and this access one here that they're using at the moment, mm -hmm. uh, made the bass really good. <laughs> so it sounds awesome in there. And um, I think the people from ESS also enjoyed, uh, enjoyed it. So, um, so I, I had these measurements. These measurements I, I have and I can, I may do something separate with them later. Um, but I made this um, 
work uh, called Sounding ESS. It's um, a computer uh, installation, and you basically have the ability to switch out the position, the, the different ones I measured. So, for example, this one would be the, the accelerator tunnel, only two meters down that tunnel from the end. <clears throat> and then you have the ability to, to play a drum loop or to uh, open a microphone, which you can s speak into, sing into. You, you tried it. Um, and then you hear your voice uh, coming back, or the drum loop coming back from, from the end of the accelerator in this example. And it's as if you're, you're actually in there listening to it, because it's recorded uh, with ambisonics and rendered a binaural on headphones. So it sounds like you're there, and you're listening to your voice come back from this space. And this was the idea of, of this um, really it was to, like, to to use this idea of sounding as a way of um, putting sound into something, but also kind of allowing people to to get a sense of the scale of it or the depth of it. Because the project really was about how do you, particularly with me, <laughs> my limited uh, scientific understanding, how do you understand this huge facility with so many complex things that can be done there and things that you can describe the benefit of to society but also you know it's that's one thing but how do you really get a sense of the scale of this you know how do you understand that there's a 600 meter long uh, kind of tunnel with this with this beam going down how do you understand there's this massive cylinder so this is a way of using acoustics to, for people to uh, relate to this space and actually by putting their own voice into it it's like now they're feeling hopefully part of that's it. a question yeah uh, I'm really not a librarian or a school mom or anything like that, but mm. those definitions, where'd you get them from? Uh, actually, I actually don't remember now. I'd have to look yeah, where... Yeah, they're wrong. Yeah, okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. it was... I, I, I tweaked them a little bit for artistic purposes, but... Oh, uh, uh, cool. Yeah, okay. yeah. So it's not a... Don't take this as a, as a dictionary definition. Uh, but okay. they, I think they did come from dictionary definitions, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, okay. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I am... Um, I'm a bit naughty like that. <laughs> No, it was uh, it was it was really like this this idea of um, appreciating using sound to appreciate the scale of something. Okay. Yeah. So I did. I, I don't know if I tweaked them or if I found ones that I just. Yeah. yeah. I wouldn't. It's not a. It's not what I do in an essay. But I think for. An, yeah. This is something that I put into the work just to frame it. Yeah. Okay. So that's. Uh, oh, you didn't have a sample of the, of the ESS sound. No, because I, I, I didn't want to complicate things by, by okay. playing something today, yeah. But you can check it out on the 9th of December at the Dissimulation Conference. It's going to be here. Okay. We'll demo of it, yeah. No, so I, I, despite working with sound, um, I thought I would not well, do that today. Well, that's called desi creating desire. Exactly. There you go. Coming yeah. back. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. But just to give you a few examples of things I've been doing and um, where, I'm, where I'm heading with projects. Super. Yeah. Um, do you have any questions, any comments? Okay, well, thank you, Tim. Thank All right, you. thank you.